the world's, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. about kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. I hope you enjoy your events in this year's digital programme and that they spark in you thoughts and conversations and feelings. All the things that a good book should do and all the things that a wonderful book festival like Edinburgh International Book Festival does too. It's a book festival that's really dear to my heart. It's one of the first festivals I attended as a new author. I was part of the Outriders Africa programme and every year returning to it feels a little bit like coming back to a literary home. It's such a pleasure to see them going online this year, and I'm so excited for the future of Edinburgh International Book Festival. Good evening and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name's Nick Barley, director of the festival, and I'm delighted to be broadcasting to you tonight from our studios here in central Edinburgh at the Assembly Rooms for the 2020 online edition of our festival. Tonight's guest is Elif Shafak, who's been a regular at the book festival for many, many years. And I've been so proud to have seen how our relationship with her as a writer has developed and how her relationship with the audience is, has developed too. Last year, she joined us to talk about her novel, 10 Minutes and 38 Seconds in This Strange World. And I was so thrilled when that book was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. And I think she was one of the first people to be shortlisted for that prize having written a book uh, in a language that was not her mother tongue. An absolutely extraordinary achievement for one of my favorite writers. This year and tonight's session, uh, which is sponsored tonight by the Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust, she'll be talking to us about this non-fiction book, How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division. It's my absolute pleasure uh, for you to join us, Elif. Good evening. Good evening, Nick. How are you? How have you been during this strange lockdown period? Yeah, it is, it is a strange time, isn't it? Everything feels so uncertain. Uh, actually, I remember throughout the lockdown seeing one tweet on social media saying, it must be very easy for writers because writers are solitary creatures anyhow, and they're used to working at home, so it's not much of a difference for them. Uh, but I, my experience is not like that at all, just the opposite. I think it affected all of us and writers too. And there are days when you find yourself questioning what you're doing 
you know, does it really matter to find a perfect synonym to, to change that coma into the next sentence? Mm. And so many people are dying in, ten, in, in thousands and hundreds. And when there's so much inequality out there, so you find yourself questioning the validity of what you're doing. But then there are days when I think you find yourself believing more in the art of storytelling, in books, and in our need for empathy and stories at a time at a time like this. So every day has been different, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, you and I had the the pleasure of working together uh, over the period of about a year when we were on the jury for the International Booker Prize uh, a few years ago. And I was very aware then, and I learned then about just how careful you are as a reader of other people's work. And, and that, was, that was really special to me. Um, have you, I mean, many people have said that they found it hard to read books during this lockdown period. Have, have you managed to, to read other people's work during this period? I did, I did actually. And I've been reading both fiction and nonfiction. Also this year, I was judging the George Orwell Prize for political writing. And together uh, with the other judges, we had a, a, as you know, of course, better than I do, a, a big tower of, of books, which I have immensely uh, enjoyed reading. That was a good experience. And I've also, of course, been, been reading uh, fiction a lot and, and poetry. I've been reading more poetry lately. Yeah. I mean, one of the strange things about this isolated experience, uh, we don't have an audience in front of us uh, looking at us and, and smiling at us as we speak, but we do know that there are, I don't know how many hundreds or perhaps a thousand people out there. I can't see the numbers on a screen at the moment, but before we came into the studio, I looked at the chat room and I saw there was somebody joining us from Vancouver, hello to you, and somebody else from Madrid. So I know that we've got an international audience facing us now, so uh, even in lockdown, we can join and be joined by a, a big audience. So that's very exciting that they can, and I know how much they love your work. That, that really means a lot to me, you know, and I think in a way that renews our faith in literature, doesn't it? I mean, maybe we'll talk about the, the dark side of digital technologies, but this bright side of digital technologies is one thing that I can never underestimate. The fact that we can connect across borders, national, religious, all, all kinds of borders we can continue to connect is, is, is very precious to me. But one thing I can tell you in all honesty, I really miss liter literary festivals, cultural festivals, Edinburgh, definitely. That vibe, that energy, it, it means a lot, that democratic space in which there's diversity and inclusion and everyone is welcome and we can exchange ideas freely and we can have nuanced debates. It's incredibly important and, and we should defend, I think, literary and, and cultural festivals even with more passion from now on. Yeah, yeah. So, so in that context, uh, you've written this long essay, How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division. I want to ask you about that this evening. Um, but I suppose I wanted to ask you uh, why you thought that now was the time to write a long essay uh, rather than fiction. And, and, and it brings to mind uh, a conversation that I, I heard you have at the book festival, I think it was eight years ago, when you were on stage at our Edinburgh World Writers Conference, and you were talking on stage with Adaf Suef, the, the Egyptian writer. And you were asking her, you, you said, you, you reminded her of Theodore Adorno's quote when he said, to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. And you asked her, you know, is fiction a luxury in times like these? Um, of course, back then, the Egyptian revolution and the, what we call the Arab Spring had just happened. And, and, and Ahdef said, it's, I'd love to hear a novel about the Egyptian revolution, but I haven't got time because I'm out on the street. How can I have time to write a novel? So, so why in that context did you decide that now was the time for a long essay rather than more fiction? Yes, it was such an interesting conversation and it really stayed with me. I, I, I'm a storyteller. My main love, passion is always fiction, you know, it's stories. Uh, so I don't think that's ever going to change. But of course, what you're writing and how you write, how you approach your subject, all of that is very much shaped by the age we're living in. We're not outside of this world, operating, writing in a vacuum. But if I may take a step further, I think if you happen to be a storyteller from a wounded land, from a wounded democracy, such as Turkey or, or Venezuela, the Philippines, Brazil, uh, Poland nowadays, Hungary. Imagine the list is getting longer and longer, unfortunately. If you happen to be a storyteller from such countries, I sincerely believe you do not have the luxury of being apolitical. 
So we can't just say, you know, I'm only going to write or talk about the story I'm working on uh, and I don't want to talk about what's happening outside the window. If a lot is happening outside the window, you have to go and look. And if what you see hurts your heart, your conscience, you need to speak up. So I think we're living in an age in which more and more authors need to be, in a way, maybe more engaged in public debates. I find this very important. But that said, nonfiction at a time like this, maybe I had a different book in my mind, a different booklet, like a manifesto. Just I, I was trying to understand my own feelings because so much was changing so fast. And when the pandemic hit and then the lockdown started, I put everything aside and I started from scratch. So in a way, I wrote a different book than the one I had in mind. And the reason why I did that is because I realized I had lots of anxieties in me. I was dealing with anxiety, with fear, sometimes with anger. And I decided to face these negative emotions. And then when you look around, of course, you realize you're not the only one. Many people, most of us, we're going through all these negative emotions together globally. And so that seemed like an important starting point for me. How do we, first of all, recognize, honestly, the presence of all these negative emotions in our lives, but then hopefully, how do we turn them into something more constructive and positive? Mm. Because last year at the Edinburgh International Book Festival, you had an extraordinary discussion with the chair of our board, Alan Little. And then you spoke about the age of populism and, and the, the sort of the problem of populism. And, and you, you defined what you meant by populism. Uh, and so this essay comes, to some extent, comes out of that kind of thinking that was already going on a year ago around the, the problem of, the, of the, the decay of trust in democracy, the age of, of the demagogue and, and, and of populist leadership. Uh, around the world. And, and I suppose it comes out of this idea that, that, that when, when the Soviet communist era ended, there was a sense that liberal democracy had won, that yeah. it, it was over, the game was over, everything but democracy. And yet somehow in the 20 years that followed, dem democracy started to sort of slightly fall apart. So, so that's still here underlying this essay, right? Do you want to say a in bit about that? Yeah, indeed. Uh, and of course, when we go back in time to late 1990s, early 2000s, Actually, not that long ago, there was so much optimism across the world. And as you pointed out, because the Soviet Union was no more, the Berlin Wall had come down, many people, both in media and academia, used to say, this is the triumph of liberal democracy. From now on, history can go only in one direction. Actually, in a way, it is the end of history, as we've known, and all the conflicts that it entailed. And from now, we're going to have a more progressive linear road ahead of us. But back then, I think the biggest optimists were tech optimists. If you remember, every now and then they would join these conferences and they would tell us how, thanks to medical um, advances, we were going to live at least 100 years from now on. Uh, it will be a completely different future. But especially they had so much trust and faith in the power of digital technologies in terms of bringing democracy to those parts of the world that seem to be lagging behind. Because how come, you know, if it's a linear progress, they would have to join that road anyhow. Uh, I think what has changed since then is that prediction, that kind of optimism, which also maybe hit an element of arrogance or made us a little bit complacent too. Uh, I, I remember reading lots of articles actually predicting that Facebook was going to bring democracy to the Middle East that Twitter was going to bring democracy to Iran. And of course, it didn't happen that way. And because we have focused on the bright side of digital technologies, unfortunately, for too long, and ignored its dark side, I find it very urgent and very important to focus on the dark side now. Because it is happening, it is occurring in front of our eyes, whether it's tech monopolies or the spread of misinformation, hate speech, slander, there's a lot there that we need to unpack and we need to be aware of. I think we also need to become active digital citizens and, and watch what's happening in the digital space. Mm. I mean, one of the ways in which you beautifully characterize this, exactly this uh, optimism and the fading of optimism is in when you remind us of the naming of children 
uh, the Egyptian child who was, called, who was named Facebook after the Egyptian revolution. And there was an, uh, there was an Israeli child who was, who was named Like. Uh, um, and yet, you know, we wonder what might, whether they still have carry those names. Uh, so so that, that, in a way, that epitomizes a writer's view on how we understand optimism. This is what you bring in, into this book. Yeah, in, indeed, I, I, I mention it in the in the book because it, it's, I've been wondering about these two children. You know, how is their life like at this moment in time? Because in a way, they were children born into an age of optimism especially digital optimism, so much so that one of them was, as you said, named Facebook. This was the beginning of the Arab Spring of the revolution. And they, it was a young Egyptian couple because they had, again, so much trust in, in Facebook and how it could connect people around democratic, progressive causes. That was their faith. And that's why they named their newborn baby daughter Facebook. I think about six months later, a family in Israel named their third child Like. So since then, I've been thinking about those two kids, Facebook in Egypt and Like in Israel. Fast forward today, we have entered the age of pessimism, the age of anxiety. It's almost like an existential angst. The age of anger, resentment, bitterness, and that optimism is no more. So I wanted to mention that contrast in the book. Mm. And yet, um, alongside this, uh, I suppose all of this was happening before we went into lockdown, and your thinking was quite well developed or developing ar around this idea of the decay of optimism and, and the, the, the arrival of pessimism. But then, of course, we had the, the lockdown and, and the, the, the pandemic. And um, something that Aaron Dutty Roy said in her essay in the Financial Times, which, which has been widely quoted, but I'll just remind anyone who hasn't heard of it. She described the virus as a kind of portal which had ripped a hole in the fabric of our reality and opened up a new world. And she said, we can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and, prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world. How, how do you feel about her vision of this portal? It, it resonates deeply with me because when people sometimes, of course, with all the good intentions, they ask, when are we going to go back to the way things were before the pandemic? When are we going to go back to the normal? I always pause, you know, because was it really normal? There's a part of me that wants to question that. And I do not want to go to the way things were before the pandemic, because it was a world of inequalities. It was a world of uh, climate emergency. There's a lot that we pretended wasn't existing. And what the pandemic has done is to reveal those structural flaws and structural inequalities and injustices in such a way that it's impossible to ignore anymore. So I think it's an important crossroads. Mm. But the, the danger is because of all the uncertainties and the complexities that we're facing at the moment, it unfortunately is also the perfect moment for demagogues. This is when the demagogue enters into the picture and says, you know what, I'm going to make things simple for you. I'm going to simplify, just follow me. And, and the demagogue always talks in binary oppositions, us versus them, polarization, more tension, more division. We've seen examples of this in country after country. So populist nationalism, populist authoritarianism, these are not dead. Uh, I think it would be a huge mistake to assume that we've left it behind. My worry is with the pandemic, in the aftermath of the pandemic, we're going to see more tribalism and this almost knee-jerk reflex to think that if we are surrounded by sameness, we will be safer. You know, that kind of closing the doors, going within, uh, that really worries me. Why, why does it worry me? Because I think we have massive global challenges ahead when our planet is burning, whether it's the possibility of another pandemic, whether it's the dark side of digital technologies, whether it's cyber terrorism. You can name so many problems. And what all these problems have in common is that they're global challenges. Mm. We cannot solve global challenges with the forces of tribalism. We cannot so solve global challenges with the forces of nationalism. So that kind of a crossroads is, I think, where we are at right now.
Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I think one of the challenges or the risks of the Arundhati Roy position is that it, it's a slightly utopian idea that we can leave all the bad bits behind and only take the good things through the portal into the new world. Of course, the risk uh, that you're, as I, you're characterizing it is that the demagogues use exactly this opportunity they see an opportunity to bring through all the, the mechanisms for gaining more power in this new world that, that we're living in. So precisely the opposite of what Arundhati laid out there might happen unless we act against it. Yeah, but of course, I, I've, as I said, it very much resonates with me what Arundhati is saying because she's saying there's another possibility and, and you know, think about that. Uh, and why don't we choose the opposite path? So th that definitely is very close to my heart. But I think the danger that I'm trying to underline is something that's already happening right now. Already authoritarian leaders and populist demagogues have been using this as an excuse. That element of fear, that element of maybe anxiety is something they can, they can exploit easily. So maybe in a nutshell, I'm trying to say this is an age in which emotions guide and misguide politics. And in return, they are being misguided and guided by politics. So we need to talk about emotions and take it more seriously and be more aware, perhaps, of the possible dangers ahead. Yeah. And one of the things that, that you bring to this book is a personal perspective, which of course is, you know, I feel it in all of your writing, that, that sense of, of how you bring yourself into your work. But uh, one of the really powerful things is, is talking about your own identity uh, and I suppose the, the sort of multiplicity of, of people that you are, when, that you bring to your writing. And I wondered whether, uh, I know it's sort of unusual, but it might maybe to, to ask you to read a little section from the book in which you talk about where you're from or where you come from as you write this book. Would that be okay? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be, I'd be happy. <clears throat> so this is just a short section from the book. <clears throat> I was born in one country, France, raised in a different one, Turkey. Spent a considerable part of my early youth in others, Spain and the US. And today, I am the citizen of another country, which I call my home, my adopted land, the UK. But the place where I have passed most of my life, both as a child and as an adult, is actually elsewhere, which is Storyland. And in that enchanted realm where the sky changes colors as in a mood ring and everything speaks in its own voice, whether a pebble or a mountain, in that varied and vast terrain, there are no borders, no passports or police, no barbed wire fences and no need for any of these. The question, where are you from, has always mattered to me and felt deeply personal, albeit equally complicated. For a long time, it was the one question I dreaded being asked. I am from multiple places I wanted to be able to say in return. I come from many cities and cultures, plural and diverse, but I'm also from the ruins and remnants of these, from the memories and forgettings, from the stories and silences. But even if I could offer this answer, it would probably fail to satisfy the person who had posed the question in the first place. Yes, but where are you really from? They would insist. I knew the format, questionnaire style. You could only fit one word in that box, no more. In an age of speed, simplicity, and fleeting glimpses, few people had either the time or the patience for long answers. So I would simply say, Turkey, and they would not, satisfied. Yeah, I thought I had heard it in your accent. Yeah, like they needed that, that prejudice confirmed, that that's where they thought you, that, that was the answer they wanted all along, but, <laughs> and yet. Simplify, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and th yet this, this idea that I've heard you quote before from Walt Whitman, I contain multitudes, uh, it seems to be, to be characteristic of your writing. And I know when you lived in Boston, you spent a lot of time reading the work of African-American women, and, and in particular, Audre Lorde, I think, resonated with you. What, what did you learn from Audre Lorde? Yeah, I, uh, after Istanbul, I, I moved to Boston, actually, and uh, I lived in Mount Holyoke. I stayed there for quite some time as a, uh, as a, on a fellowship that was given to women writers and artists. But I think I spent most of my time in, in, in the library. Uh, and, and that began my, in a way, 
long interest in African-American women's movement of past generations. So I'm especially talking about 1960s and, and 1970s. It's very interesting when you look at their works, not only Audre Lorde, but of course she's very special, to, uh, very close to my heart, but across the board, when you look at their works, it's incredibly nuanced the way they talk about power. Because many of them were women, they knew how patriarchy worked, how misogyny, how sexism worked. Because many of them were women of color, they were on the receiving end of racism and they knew how racism worked. Again, many of them came from LGBTQ backgrounds, so they knew how homophobia or transphobia worked. And equally importantly, I think many of them came from disempowered, disadvantaged backgrounds. They weren't born into wealthy families. So they knew how class hierarchy worked. And when you add all those layers on top of each other, uh, it's very interesting when they talk about identity, when they talk about power, they do it in a very, very layered way. And I like that very much. And I think fast forward today, maybe in progressive movements today, we have lost that to a certain extent because we tend to talk about identity in more singular in relatively more monolithic terms, which is not close to my heart. I don't like identity and I don't like identity politics, perhaps I should say. What I do like, what I do prefer is multiple belongings. Mm. And I, when I look at you, when I look at each and every human being, I see multiple belongings. When I look at myself, of course, there's no doubt I'm an Istanbulite. I think I'm very attached to Istanbul. Anyone who reads my fiction will see immediately that Istanbul has a very strong presence in my heart, in my soul, whether I live there or not. But at the same time, I'm very attached to the Balkans, put me next to a Bulgarian author, Romanian author, Bosnian author, you know, Greek author. I have so much in common. Equally, um, I have elements in my soul from the Middle East. Again, it put me next to an Iranian, Lebanese, Jordanian, Egyptian author. I have so much in common. And at the same time, I, I'm a European um, citizen by birth, by choice, the values that I share. Over the years, I became a Londoner. I became very attached to this city and the UK, and I became a British citizen. And despite what Theresa May and several politicians have been telling us lately, I would like to call myself a citizen of the world, a citizen of humanity too. That doesn't mean that you are a citizen of nowhere. It doesn't mean that you're floating in the air aimlessly without any attachments, without a care for anything, just the opposite. It means that you can care about multiple things at the same time. And sometimes people say, well, yes, but not everyone traveled, let's say, as much. I, I understand and I respect that. But all I'm trying to say is multiple belongings has nothing to do with traveling. We might be born in one town, maybe we got married and had kids and settled in the same town all throughout our lives. Still, we have multiple belongings, whether it's our ancestors, maybe the sports teams that we feel attached to, other cultural allegiances. You know, there are lots of layers that compose the, that complexity of every human being. And we ignore that in the name of identity politics. So I do want to defend multiple belongings. And to me, this is much more progressive. Mm. But isn't there something, uh, in this, this age of division that, that you're talking about in your book, in this age of division, part of the, the division is between, uh, perhaps it's social media, between different groups who are emphasizing one uh, aspect of their identity, and for good reasons. Uh, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but the, 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 there's a risk that, that groups become divided by the, the binary nature of social media. I, 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 I mean, I have definitely a lot of respect and, and, and support for Black Lives Matter. It's, I think, also, again, very maybe clear in, in my works. Why do I say this? Because I think if you're a writer, you're not only interested in stories. As we spoke about earlier, you're also interested in silences and the silenced. To me, it's very important to try to bring the periphery to the center, to try to give more power to the disempowered to try to make the invisible a bit more visible, you know, uh, and, and give more voice to the silences. So in that regard, I, I find it incredibly important that we listen to people from different backgrounds who tell us that they're hurt and their voices have never been heard. This is our duty, this is our responsibility as human beings. But what I'm saying is, 
That is an important starting point. It cannot be where we end up. We should always expand. So I, I think in more intersectional terms, within Black Lives Matter, within progressive movements, let us not forget the diversity, the inclusion. If there are any inequalities, let's also pay attention to that so that we can constantly expand and broaden our, our vision. Uh, I can say the same thing for the feminist movement. The, the movement that I have in my heart is one that, again, expands. Definitely the feminist movement that I love and, and dream of and I support is one that is aware of racial inequalities, class inequalities, cultural inequalities, and also sometimes the divide between the big cities and the countryside, this widening gap, which is not fair. We need to talk about so much, right? At the same time, I think women's movement needs to go hand in hand with LGBTQ rights, and at the same time, bring men on board, particularly young men, who also are not comfortable with the roles of masculinity that are being imposed on them. Because one thing that I've learned in a country as patriarchal as Turkey is, of course, it's not easy to be a woman in a patriarchal land, but oftentimes it's not easy to be a man either especially if you're a young man, if you don't conform to the given description of masculinity, your life can be very difficult. So expand and have allies and walk together and I always emphasize that we're in this fight, we're in this struggle, all of us together. To me, those connections are very important. Mm. But nevertheless, the, the structures of the world in which we live, political, economic and social, tend to emphasize the, the existing power uh, of the power of the of the patriarchy, if you can call it that. How can we? How do you think we can have a nuanced discussion about these these multiplicities against that backdrop of the structures which seem so intractable, which seem to have been reinforced by social media, reinforced even by the pandemic? Yeah, um, unfortunately, and um, in a way, uh, the media has always also been moving in that direction because when you turn on a TV debate. Usually we see two speakers with completely opposite views, but equally certain of their views. And then it becomes a moment of clashing certainties. That is not a proper intellectual exchange. I think a real intellectual exchange means I have my thoughts. I've been thinking about these. You know, I, I came here with my opinions, but I also came here to listen to you. If what you tell me makes sense to me, I'm ready to change my, my views or revise my view, views. And that's, that's a good thing. But we forgot that. And also, I think we forgot to say, I don't know. Uh, when was the last time we ever said, I don't know about anything? You know, you can ask me everything, anything you want. If I don't know, I can just Google it. And in the next five minutes, I can have the illusion, the impression that I know something about the subject. But in fact, I know nothing. So I think I make a distinction between information, knowledge, and wisdom. And I believe we live in an age in which we are bombarded with information. We have way too much information, let alone misinformation. And the truth is we cannot deal with it. We don't process it. It doesn't stay with us. All we're doing is skim, you know, up and down, scroll uh, on our social media feeds, but we don't really go deep into the subject. Knowledge is something else than information. Knowledge requires to slow down. Knowledge requires books, you know, and it requires investigative journalism, more nuanced way of thinking, and definitely not rushing to conclusions. But then there's wisdom, which I think should be ultimate, our, our aim. Uh, and wisdom requires to bring the mind and the heart together. It requires emotional intelligence. It requires empathy. And for that, we need stories and the art of storytelling. So I just want to change this ratio. If we have way too much information, less knowledge, even less wisdom, how do we lessen the information that we deal with in our daily lives, increase the amount of knowledge in our daily lives, and hopefully increase our wisdom in the long run? So in a sense, uh, too much information leads to a kind of knowledge deficit and certainly a wisdom deficit. So, so you'd like to, to undo that. Uh, and, and does that explain perhaps why by the advent of social media, which, which we were promised would bring democracy and, and, and it would bring freedom to the world, seems to have almost sucked power uh, more towards uh, to certain small companies and, and, and taken democracy away to some extent? Is it the, is the information overload that, that's caused that? 
that's definitely part of the reason. But I think we also need to talk about power. I wouldn't want I wouldn't want anyone in this world to be too powerful. We wouldn't we wouldn't want our politicians to be extremely powerful, would we? I mean, monopoly of power again coming from a country like Turkey where there's an absolute monopoly of power. That is not a democracy. Again, countries like Turkey have shown us let us remember Turkey has elections, Russia has elections. These are not democracies. Relatively, they have regular elections. So I have a lot of respect for the ballot box and for referendums, but all I'm saying is, in itself, a referendum, a ballot box, doesn't make a system a democracy. In addition to the ballot box, we need rule of law. We definitely need, need separation of powers, checks and balances. Definitely there has to be an independent, diverse media where you can come across multiple opinions and independent academia, where people can research independently, freely. Definitely women's movements, minority rights, women's rights, all of those components, in addition to the ballot box, they help to make a democracy thrive and survive. So if you don't have any of these, and if you have a monopoly of power, that's a very dangerous thing. Now, coming back to the tech world, if you have a monopoly of power in the tech world, if you have tech monopolies, how can that be healthy? How can that be good for any of us? It's too much power concentrated in the hands of very few. And I think we should be very critical of that. Mm. And one of the things you do very well in this book, uh, the central section, you, you talk about the rise of a, a kind of disillusion and bewilderment in the world, which results from the, the kinds of things you're talking about. But even more importantly, I think, uh, you talk about the, the right to feel pessimistic and even the, the, the importance of acknowledging anger that we feel. Um, how, how do you go about that in the book? Yes, I, I think what I realized as I was writing this book was simply this, it is okay not to be okay, you know? At this moment in time, if you're feeling anxious, if some days you wake up, you're angry, worried, even incandescent, it's, it's understandable. But the issue is, once we recognize that, how do we move on together? How do we connect? There is, if there's one emotion that is even much more dangerous than all kinds of anger and fear, that is numbness. I think we need to be careful about numbness. When we lose all emotions, when we stop responding to the world, to the events around us, that kind of indifference, in my opinion, that kind of apathy is far more dangerous. And when you read the memoirs of survivors, people who have survived the darkest chapters in human history, whether it's the Holocaust or civil wars or genocides, I find it very interesting that many survivors ask us one fundamental question. They're saying, how is it possible that such atrocities can occur? Is it because human beings are evil by nature? And then survivors look around and they say, well, there are some evil people, but most human beings like you, like me, it's a combination of good and bad, you know? We have all, all those complexities and conflicts inside us. So the survivors ask us, how is it possible then that such atrocities can happen on such widespread, you know, on such scales, broad scales? And the answer they're giving is, is maybe the opposite of goodness is not necessarily evil or wickedness. Maybe we need to focus on numbness. Because if enough people stop caring, if enough, stop, if enough people stop reading, you know, feeling empathy, if it means nothing to us, whether people are drowning while trying to cross into Europe, whether it's 5,000 people, 500,000 people, whether it, if it doesn't mean anything to us, that is a very dangerous threshold. And that kind of apathy is something that I find very worrisome. So coming back to anger, in a way, anger shows that we are responding. But at the same time, we need to be careful about anger because it can be very toxic. It can be very repetitive, destructive. And in the long run, it can lead to arrogance as well because it, it, it gives us the, the feeling that we know better. So we have to take that energy of anger and channel it into, into something more constructive. Mm -hmm. And for that, we need to connect with our fellow human beings. Yeah. So I give a very long answer, but I think it is okay to be a pessimist intellectually at this moment in time, 
but our hearts, our, our opinion, you know, our, our will, as Gramsci would say, has to be more hopeful, more optimistic. And for that, we need to connect with our fellow human beings. Of course, and yet, oddly enough, I, it seems to me that the, the, some of the political messaging that we're getting is precisely to try to encourage that, I suppose, an element of, of apathy or, or what you might call, so what? So as you say, uh, re refugees crossing the channel, uh, some of the political messaging seems to be, so what if, if these people are refugees, uh, they shouldn't be coming. And the Bel Belarusian president, thousands of people are protesting in the streets and he's saying, so what, I'm still going to try and cling on to power. Uh, across the world, the demagogues are, are encouraging a kind of, so what, it doesn't, they don't really care if people are, are protesting against things, so what. So, so it, they themselves are trying to encourage the kind of apathy that you're, that you're asking us to fight against. That, that is very true. And also it's dehumanization, isn't it? Because that's how they do it. The reason why they can so easily say, so what about others is because they do not see these people as equal human beings. And in that regard, I think we need to pay attention to how human beings are dehumanized by several narratives mm. and I think it always starts with words so when we look at systematic discrimination systematic inequality it really doesn't start with concentration camps it doesn't start with putting crosses on your neighbor's house because she or he might be ethnically or religiously or, or racially different let's say you know all of those horrific horrific stages come later I think it starts with words it starts with seemingly innocent jokes, how words, how language are used. So I believe the fight against dehumanization needs to also start with words. It yeah. needs to start with stories in that regard. Uh, and, in, 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 and my hope is that literature can help to rehumanize people who have been dehumanized in that way that you describe systematically. Yeah, that's certainly what you do in, in your novels. Um, but three words that, that you've used uh, already and which I'm just going to uh, throw back to you now, words which matter a lot, tribalism, isolationism and nationalism. These are things that you've argued strongly against. And yet, uh, as we're broadcasting from Scotland, that word nationalism has a particular resonance here. Um, in previous years, you've been interviewed by Nicola Sturgeon on, on the stage at the Edinburgh International Book Festival, and, and you also were in conversation with her in London recently. That word nationalism, she might argue that it has a different kind of resonance in Scotland. How, how do you respond to her brand of civic nationalism? Yes, nationalism is a, is a subject that I care about passionately, deeply, and I've been thinking about a lot uh, for long years now, because when you come from Anatolia, when you come from the Middle East, when you come from the Balkans, nationalism for us is not a theoretical, it's not an abstract debate, perhaps. We have seen over and over the bloodshed, the atrocities, the, the hostilities that nationalism has been breeding. So in, in a nutshell, I'm, I'm someone who's very critical of nationalism, and I want to be able to think beyond nationalisms, I want to be able to think in, in, in a more international way, you know, uh, with international solidarity, with maybe global sisterhood. But coming back to the discussions that I had with Nicola Sturgeon, which, which left an impact on me and which, which was brilliant, really, truly inspiring. We did two events, one in Edinburgh, one at the National Theatre in London. And in both events, we talked about, uh, about nationalism. To me, it was very nice to be able to share my own experiences with her and we had very nuanced conversations and she was also able to of course share her own experiences the interesting thing about the scottish case uh, at the moment which she also emphasized uh, it, uh, in, in a very interesting way uh, in london when we had the discussion in london she said in fact by emphasizing our identity we're choosing the international path because we want, to be, we want to stay connected with Europe at a time when the UK is drifting away from Europe because of the Brexit saga. So that's, that's an interesting angle. And I'm, and I'm ready to think about that and I'm ready to talk about that in, in, in more depth. But I also want to underline that as we're speaking, whether you look at India, whether you look at Turkey, whether you look at Brazil, Hungary, and I, you know, we can name hundreds of examples in the name of nationalism, uh, a lot of 
inequalities, injustices are being perpetuated. We cannot ignore that. So nationalism might have had some kind of progressive edge 100 years ago in anti-colonial struggles in some parts of the world, but I do not believe it is the answer to today's global challenges. Okay, that's great. Now, I, I see that time's ticking on and I want to bring in questions from the audience, but before I do, one uh, last question from me, which is about solutions. Okay, you've very clearly articulated the problems about this age of division. Your book's called How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division, and I think sane, the word sane, I, I'm taking to mean how to solve the problem of the age of division. What are the solutions that you're offering? How to stay sane in a way is also to, to to recognize that there are no easy solutions, to recognize that anyone who promises us simplicity and quick fix solutions is actually lying. That is one of the arguments that, the, the, you know, that I try to make in the book. This is a complicated age. We need to understand these complexities. And rather than following the, the line of jingoism, tribalism, uh, more reactionary politics or, or politics of fear and resentment, we need to connect as human beings in order to solve the global challenges ahead. I am worried that our public spaces, our democratic spaces are shrinking. You know, coming back, maybe we're, we're drawing a full circle here. We started with democracy. It's worth remembering that unlike what people thought in late 1990s and early 2000s, History can go backwards. Democracy is much more fragile than we initially assumed. It's a very delicate ecosystem of checks and balances. So I do not have quick solutions, but I do know that we all need to become more engaged, more active, and in my opinion, more vocal citizens, well, both public citizens, but also digital citizens. One of the worries that I have is that, and it's happening in the UK right now, you will, you, I'm sure you would have seen them. Every research showed that throughout Brexit debates, people started saying, you know, I don't watch it anymore. I just turn off the TV or I just change the channel because I'm sick and tired of seeing the same debates. But what happens when moderates take a step back from the public space, unfortunately it's the extremists and usually populist extremists who have the passion to dominate the discussions. And I don't think we should uh, let that happen. So it is important that we celebrate, appreciate diversity, inclusion, and keep these democratic spaces and discussions, open discussions alive. Mm. So my, my tablet here we're, we're, is bristling with audience questions. It's very exciting. Um, and they're typically quali high quality Edinburgh questions. But this one, it comes from somebody called Hassan TL, uh, who says, how does one communicate a story rooted in a specific culture without sacrificing the cultural context, but also appealing to a wide range of readers? That's such, such an important question, and I, one that really matters to me. Um, I think, at, at least I, I want to base it on my own personal experience. When I write, I want to stay loyal to the story without thinking or worrying too much about whether someone in, let's say, Canada or Brazil or Portugal is going to find the story familiar if the story takes place in Turkey. You know what I mean? So I, I try not to worry about these things. And I want to be loyal to the flow of the story, the characters, my imagination. Of course, there are certain things you might have to explain a bit more to an international audience, but without taking anything from the core of the story, we have to do that. So all I can tell you is when I'm writing a novel, and the novel is, is an amazing experience in that regard because for weeks, for months, sometimes for years, you have to stay in that imaginary zone. I try to stay there as long as I can, as faithfully as I can. And only when the book is over and I hand it to my editor, then I start to worry what people might say, how they react to the book. But by then it's too late. The book is born and the book is free and independent of my worries. And I think that's the way it should be. That's an incredibly inspiring response. Um, sort of the, the other end of the spectrum, I've got Linda C here who says, I am so depressed at the moment at the denigration of our democracy and the state of discourse in the UK. I'm not proud to be British. What signs of hope do you see to help people like me? 
Thank you so much. First of all, for your honesty. Thank you. And, and believe me, that feeling resonates with so many people coming from very different countries. Um, maybe until recently, again, there was this assumption um, in, in general, this assumption that some parts of the world were a little bit more solid, safe, steady. Some parts of the world were regarded as liquid lands. But now we know that actually we're all living in liquid times. There's no such thing as solid lands versus liquid lands. We're all affected by these uncertainties. Sometimes we cannot recognize our motherlands. Sometimes we cannot recognize our own politicians or, or, or the media or the language of politics is changing using martial metaphors as if having differences of opinion is like an army, you know, warfare. So all of that, of course, is deeply, deeply depressing. But please let us not forget that politics and the people is not the same thing. When we talk to people, our fellow human beings, whether it's women, youth, young people, minorities, people from all backgrounds who are incredibly resilient and connected and passionate despite all the challenges, then we find the hope that we are looking for. So I, I, I share your pessimism, but at the same time, let us please not lose touch with uh, people who feel exactly like you at this moment in time. Mm. Absolutely, and I think that this next question, you, you may partially have answered this already in, in what you just said, but I'll ask it anyway. David Kay says, what worries me is that our political discourse, especially in the West, is based on selfishness. The African concept of Ubuntu, Ubuntu, I should say, um, and that concept means I am me because I live in a community of other people, that concept is something that we need to adopt. How do you think we can do that? I think in this regard, we're living uh, at a very important time because the pandemic made us stop and ask ourselves fundamental questions. So one of the things that I tried to underline in the book was, this is not only a crisis of health, it's not only an economic crisis or a crisis of uh, unemployment, etc., or political incompetence on the part of our rulers. I think this is a crisis of meanings and, and definitions. And now we have to slow down and stop and redefine some of the very basic concepts that we have taken for granted for too long. For example, we need to ask ourselves, what is happiness? How do I define happiness? Is it, let's say, greed-driven you know, business models? Is it always demanding more? Um, this neoliberal model that has been applied to every inch of the society, even into education, even into health systems. Is it that way? Or are we going to define and, and search happiness actually in things that have no material value, such as family, friendships, love, but also our connection with the nature, which we have ignored and belittled for too long, and now we're paying the consequences for that. So all I'm trying to say is, right now we're going through this almost existential questioning about our central meanings uh, and how we define life, uh, how we define happiness, but also whether we're gonna be selfish or not is gonna be a big part of this question, because if we are selfish, we're gonna continue with the same model but if we are going to think about the coming generations and their happiness, then we're going to change the way we live and consume, right? So lots of definitions have to be, in my opinion, redefined. Mm. But one of, one of those definitions that maybe we need to, to think about it is the definition of democracy. You know, yeah. if, if faith in democracy is in decline, and if we're not sure that, that we're distributing uh, the, the, the voices of, of the people in, in our society fairly through the democratic processes we have. How can we uh, help democracy thrive? Where can democracy exist? And I suppose uh, one obvious question would be, how can stories, and, and in fact, how can the novel help democracy? Can, can the novel actually be part of a democratic process? I, I honestly think it can because at least to me, the novel is one of our last remaining democratic spaces. And the reason why I say this is because when you read a novel, at least for a few hours, for a few days, you stop being yourself. You become someone else. 
and look at the world through their eyes. That cognitive ability, that cognitive shift, that empathy is something we deeply, deeply need. Also, I believe writers are not supposed to try to teach anything or preach anything. I don't like that kind of literature, to be honest. But what I like is when we ask questions, we have to be able to ask difficult questions about difficult issues and open up spaces where a diversity of opinions can be heard. And you always leave the answer to the reader because every reader's opinion is going to be different and I have to be respect that. But that space itself has to be free and nuanced and layered. So there's a lot I think literature can contribute. But coming back to the trust in democracy, I find it very important that we can we be able to renew our faith in democracy. Because one thing that worries me immensely is more and more people, and I hear this across the Middle East and in Turkey a lot, have started saying, you know what, maybe democracy doesn't suit our national character anyhow. It's a Western thing. It's not a global thing. It's not a universal thing. Maybe we need a different model. And that different model can be like a benevolent dictator knowing what's best for the society. Let us please not go in that direction. Of course, democracy is not best. Democracy is not, sorry, perfect. Of course, it has its flaws, but we need to work for it. And we need to make it a better, a much more progressive and inclusive democracy rather than abandon it. Mm. And one of the multiple effects of all these things you're talking about, you know, the, the, the apathy, the so what tendency, the, the decline in faith in democracy, uh, it, and the marginalization of, of people is, is silence, is to silence groups, either because they themselves don't feel confident to speak or because they are actively silenced by others. So where does silence, where, where is the problem of silence in all of this? I think it's a big, big part of the conversation. Where are the silences in every society at a given time? And also who are the silenced people at this moment in time? If they don't have enough access to media, if I can't hear their voices, if there isn't equality in the public space, uh, it, is, it is a big, big problem. I guess all I'm trying to say is we've come at a moment, we've come at a stage when inequality is no longer a footnote. You know, it can't be treated as a side issue. I think it has to be at the center of all of our efforts and action plans from now on. And when I say inequality, I mean all kinds of inequality, whether it's gender, whether it's economic, financial inequality, but also geographical inequality. If all the resources go to certain parts of the country and the rest is forgotten or, or um, doesn't enjoy the same opportunities, that's a big problem. The pandemic has shown us, even in the same city, in London, if you live in a wealthier neighborhood, your chances of contracting the virus and dying from the virus is much less compared to someone living in a poorer neighborhood within the same city. So there's a lot we need to talk about and face. Right now, so many children, because of the lockdown and the situation, of course, they couldn't attend school, but it's poorer children who have been suffering enormously because they didn't have the same kind of access to books or cultural events and activities. We need to be aware of all of those silences and we need to work together to hopefully make the world a better place. Mm. We're running out of time, sadly. There's so much more we could talk about on this, but I just want to fit in one quick question uh, from Helen W. Do you have any hopeful words for coping in this time of anxiety? Do you see us coming out the other side in terms not just of health, but regaining civil liberties? I think the... the I, I, you know, I don't, at least personally, I, I, I don't feel happy, I don't feel optimistic, hopeful every day. Some days are darker, some days are harder, but I do know that that's okay. You know, it's okay, as we said, not to be okay at a moment like this. But let us please not forget that you're the, not the only one, I am not the only one. Many, many of us are experiencing these ups and downs and worries and anxieties together. It shows that we are human. It shows that we care. It shows that we are not numb. And to me, that is incredibly precious. So even within our negative emotions, there is a seed of hope. Inside, it's a bit like yin-yang, isn't it? Within that darkness, 
there is a positive core. And all I can say is let's try to find that positive core and focus on that. Elif Shafak, it's an absolute joy to talk to you as ever. Um, your book, How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division, is a lovely read. I think it's four ninety nine. It's a, it's a, you can consume it in an afternoon and you will just find so much hope as well as some anger in it. So I urge you to buy it along with, with 10 minutes and 38 seconds in this strange world if you haven't read that novel already. You can buy it from our own independent online bookstore by clicking the button just below the screen somewhere down there. Um, please buy it from us because it will help support the book festival as well as helping Elif Shafak uh, continue her great work. And if you've loved hearing today's free event, and if you believe in the power of this nuanced public discourse, then please, if you can, help support the book festival so that we can continue to bring these kinds of events in the future. There's a donate button below. I urge you, if you possibly can, to donate something towards the festival for the future, and so we can bring Elif and other brilliant writers like her back. But that's all for us tonight. And it remains for me to say thank you again, Elif, for a wonderful conversation. And I hope, for, uh, hope to see you in Edinburgh soon. Thank you. Me too. Such a privilege and pleasure. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you, everyone.